welcome to my Tuesday morning in the office. Today, I am going to do a Q&A video. So I'm going to answer y'all's questions. I went on Instagram and asked if you had any questions for me. And there are some questions in there. So we're going to get them answered. And while I'm doing that, I am going to be shipping out items and then doing some inventory. So I have a full day of work ahead of me. I've got three hours, which is great, to commit to getting some stuff done. And I'm also gonna photograph, but I probably won't film that part of it. But I do definitely need to spend a solid chunk of time photographing today. But we have quite a few sales because this is the Tuesday after President's Day weekend. So some sales have accumulated over those three days. They're on all three platforms, Poshmark, eBay, and Mercari. So I'm going to go ahead and pull those items now. Let's get started with our first question. I'm just gonna go on, I'm just on Instagram answering y'all's questions. And I'll start from the first one that came in. How are you feeling? Due date around the corner. Today is February 20th. My due date is April 1st. And if I sound like I'm out of breath, <laughs> because I'm pregnant. I always talk about that. Okay, let's start pulling things. I feel, I actually have a prenatal therapist and I was talking with her yesterday. I just am starting to feel like it will be okay <laughs> once the baby gets here. I was feeling overwhelmed, underprepared, had no idea how I was gonna do it, but I've started getting all the stuff I need for her ready. I organized this big closet in our house that was just really cluttered, where I stored all of the baby clothes in our, that I have accumulated, baby and kid clothes that I get from the bins and so forth. So I was able to take inventory of everything I had and then I bought on Poshmark like 14 zero to three footsies, which was great because now I feel very like, okay, I got that taken care of. I want, we did a Facebook marketplace run where I went and got a changing pad, an extra changing pad. I'd already gotten a changing table from Facebook marketplace. I just don't want to pay retail for these things that I know I'm literally only going to have for like a few years at most. The kids clothing I'm literally going to use for like months. <laughs> so I was hoping I could thrift them, but I just haven't been able to find them. So I was happy to get that done. And then I started making a list last night of everything else I need to do. So I feel good. I'm very, I mean, I'm very excited to meet her. That's a no brainer. That's the best part. There's everything else that comes with that, that you have to be prepared for. What are some bread and butter men's brands that you like picking up? Oh, this is a good question. I don't like really specialize in men's, so I'm not selling a ton of bread and butter men's. There are a lot of brands that I come across often enough where I would consider them, I guess, I don't know if I would consider them bread and butter, but I would consider them like solid sellers that's not like a designer, you know? Here, let me look at a list in one second. I'm gonna pull, pull some things and then I'll catch my breath <laughs> and answer this question. Okay, so my favorite men's brands to pick up. I like picking up Duluth Trading Company still. It doesn't sell for a ton of money, but I think it does sell really reliably. I like picking up the brand Dewar, D-U slash E-R. They make both men and women's. Of course, like Wari and Arcteryx are gonna be the best brands, both for men and women, probably to pick up. Muggsy, I really, really like that brand. Built, that brand is really good. B-Y-L-T. Bird Dog is a brand that is new to me, but it sells so fast. Like I found Bird Dog shorts with pretty significant flaws and they sold really fast for $20. So if you find a good condition or excellent condition, a pair of Bird Dogs pants or shorts, they're gonna sell really fast. Icebreaker and like Smart Wool are, you know, men's and women's, some of my favorites. Taylor Stitch is a brand I really like finding and selling. I do like selling Theory and Vince in men's a lot. I like selling it a lot more than women's actually. It doesn't really necessarily sell super fast, but it sells reliably in my experience, the newer tag stuff, especially if it has like, like a sweater that's wool, for example, some kind of material content that makes it more valuable. 
I really like selling men's prana. I'm pickier with what I pick up. But, and also Madewell jeans, by men's Madewell jeans. I know I've heard other people say that it doesn't sell. It sells well for me. Mountain Khakis is a good bread and butter brand. Some of their pants can sell really well. Buck Mason, love selling Buck Mason. I like selling Billy Reed too. I come across it more frequently than you would think. The website Huckberry is a really good uh, website to go look at good bolo slash, slash bread and butter brands. I say bread and butter because it doesn't retail for a ton of money, but they sell really quickly. Like this Wellen sweater that I found one time was really good. That's a brand that's sold on Huckberry. Public Rec, really, really good brand to know and pick up. That would be, I'm not someone who specializes in men's for sure. There are a lot of men's brands that are, I think, popping up, especially, you know, direct to consumer brands, which are basically brands that sell online directly to a consumer. They're not in any retail stores. Like this brand, Miles, the brand Unreal that I just picked up, UNRL. Oh, and when, if you're gonna go into men's, you should definitely know Roback. I found that one time and it sold really well. And Barstool Sports golf shirts have done really well for me when I found them. Okay, I'm gonna move all this stuff over and then we're gonna get shipping done. It's gonna take a little bit of time, answer more questions. So I actually had to charge my microphone for a second, but while I did that, I shipped out my Mercari sales. I only had two Mercari sales. The first was that Seraphine jacket. I honestly should have probably sold this for more. <laughs> But that's okay. I My cost of goods was really high because I actually purchased it for me. It was like 38 bucks. I had it listed for 90 because it was missing the baby wearing section of the jacket. But then I realized actually the baby wearing section of the jacket is sold separately anyway. So actually I wasn't missing anything. But anyway, I listed it for 90 and then I received an offer that same day. I listed it on Mercari for 72 which I went ahead and accepted. My shipping was $10 though. So after my cost of goods and shipping and fees. My gross was only $14.29, but it did sell same day, so that was good. And then my other Mercari sale was a pair of figs pants, and I need to start being a little bit more selective with figs, but these I got at the bins. Um, I had them for 363 days, spent 90 cents on them, had them listed for 35. They sold on Mercari for $25.92, which after shipping and fees, came out to $14, shipping fees and cost of goods, came out to $14.85. So those are my two Mercari sales. I just actually had another Mercari sale come in today. It wasn't, it was like a $12 sale, it wasn't major, but starting to see more Mercari sales, which is exciting. So let's get going on eBay sales. I'm just gonna like answer questions while I package these up because in order for me to get my gross profit, I have to figure out my shipping costs anyway and then we'll go over all my eBay sales. And so while I'm packaging them up, I will answer some questions. I had one person on Instagram ask a bunch of questions. What are the, pri I'll just answer them quickly. What are the primary ways you stay current on brands? I would say I do research. Like whenever I have a free moment, I will go do research either by basically doing trend research by looking at different retailers, seeing what they're selling, looking at different influencers, seeing what they're wearing, go, looking through different articles and so forth. Or I'll do comp research where I'll just go on eBay or mainly Poshmark, that's the platform I'm most familiar with. And I will really just look through solds and see like if there are any brands that I don't recognize that I don't know. And there almost always are. And I learned a lot of brands that way. And I'll just take screenshots and write it down in my notes. But I'm constantly doing that because I want to sell. <laughs> I want to find what is selling. I don't want to find what was selling, you know, a year ago. I want to find uh, what is selling now because those things can change pretty quickly. Next question was, how much do you rely on data analytics to determine what you pick up? I mean, I check comps. If I don't haven't sold something recently or feel confident because I've checked comps, or had an understanding of the resale value fairly recently, then I will check comps. And that is how I, that's the data I go off of. Biggest learning curve for transitioning from Poshmark to eBay? I think for most people it's shipping, which, I mean, there's a lot of parts to eBay, but most of them are not that like complicated. The only one that's like pretty different is shipping. And if you want to be like me, just the easiest way to do it is just do a flat rate shipping for everybody. Or the other option is weigh your items and then just do calculated shipping. But 
once you get a feel for how shipping goes on eBay, you'll realize it's really simple. It's not that hard. And the sooner you start your eBay account, the better because, because it takes time to build up a selling history on eBay. And your selling history matters a lot in terms of your rank and search on eBay and also just what buyers are going to be willing to buy from you if you, you know, haven't sold much. So start as soon as you can because it just does take a while. And then their last question was, I love this question actually, how important is having a social media presence to getting sales? So I would say if your goal is to have a really strong reselling business and if you're just talking about sales and reselling, you want to spend as little time on social media as possible. <laughs> and you want to not focus at all on building a social media presence. I cannot tell you how time intensive having a YouTube channel is. I cannot tell you how time intensive building an Instagram following is. They're all very time intensive and energy intensive, emotion intensive. But if your goal is, it's essentially just like having another business. And I will you know, say I do get sales from Y'all, sometimes people who watch my YouTube channel will buy things from me, which is so appreciated and so great. It's probably less than what you think. It's probably more than what I think <laughs> because not everyone announces themselves. But the sales I get from, you know, building a social media presence are far offset by the um, just amount of time I spend doing this. Like it's, uh, it's really not worth it at all if that was all I was going after. However, while, I mean, I don't really use my channel to promote my, like, I don't really push, you know, you guys buying stuff from me for my reselling business. And there are ways to do that if you really wanted to, that to be how you monetize your social media presence, which I don't push that at all. But essentially you're having another income stream and it is in some ways much more reliable than reselling. And it's just very different. I mean, there are definitely seasonality components and then there are different aspects that influence your income, but it's just essentially having another business that produces income. So if you wanted to diversify your income streams, I would say that's a really big reason why you might wanna start a social media presence, especially YouTube. YouTube's like the easiest way to place to monetize, but also like it helps with keeping me on task and it motivated and also it helps me with feeling less lonely which is a huge part of reselling like it's it's something you have to, if you're going to become a full-time reseller you're not going to have co-workers and so unless you you know hire people and then even your employees aren't really your co-workers it's not the same unfortunately they can still definitely provide you with company that is really nice it can get really lonely so it's something to manage and have like an active strategy for whether it's meeting up with other resellers having a social media presence what have you it's definitely something that you have to think about and before going into reselling full-time So another question was, do I travel out of state for inventory? I, when I lived in Kansas, I did all the time. Like I would take regularly scheduled trips. Oh, I just break this. If you're gonna get bags for your reselling business, get the hefty ones. Like they're more expensive, but they don't break. These Ziploc ones or the cheap ones, off-brand ones, they break. Anyway, I used to all the time when I lived in Kansas, but now that I live in Portland, I don't really need to leave the state. I, in fact, I don't really need to leave Portland. And uh, now that I have a child with a nap schedule, I definitely don't have the time, unfortunately. So, no, I don't think I've, I haven't even gone up to Seattle or Washington. I, I did go to Vancouver, I think once or twice because my car dealership is up there also. <laughs> so sometimes when I'm like, have to drop my car off for maintenance or something, I will just check out a Goodwill up there, but I've never had any luck. So yeah, I mean, no, not really, not anymore. I would love to like have a vacation to LA or something where I went thrifting, but it's not a priority right now. Okay, next question. If you had to choose between Poshmark and eBay, which would it be? Poshmark. I was just thinking about this the other day. The reason I get so angry at Poshmark <laughs> 
is because I love selling on Poshmark. I really do. And I get upset because when I feel like they're not making the right decisions to like maximize sales, because that's essentially, you know, Poshmark company and Poshmark sellers have aligned interests in, in a lot of ways. Yeah, when I, the promoted closets thing and the search algorithm, which is still a nightmare. The reason I get frustrated with them is because I want it to be, I would love to only sell on Poshmark if I could. It's just such an easier platform. I still have the majority of my sales on Poshmark and I don't have returns really on Poshmark. That's honestly such a big reason because my return rate on eBay, I just checked, is like eight and a half percent, which it's down from what it previously was at 10%, which is so high. And I know it's not because of me. <laughs> it's because people return things because it doesn't fit or they don't like it all the time. That's, I mean, vast majority of the situation. I could go, I have no, I could guess why that is, why my return rate is so high. I don't, I think it's higher, much higher than average clothing resellers. Like I have friends who have like four to 5%, but I don't know, I, I just hate the returns. Every time I sell something on eBay, I'm like, is this gonna get returned? And then it's just more complicated. There are more factors. There's just, I don't know. I, I don't dislike eBay. I just like Poshmark so much more. Okay, so let's go over my eBay sales. I had how eight sales that I'm shipping out right now on eBay. Uh, the first was, this free people solid Brahmi top that here let me print my labels that um i got in a free people palette i've talked about this palette ad nauseum on this channel but i paid about eleven dollars and something per item and eleven dollars and 34 cents per item and i had a lot of duplicates of certain items and so this one i have a bunch of i have it listed for 25 someone sent me an offer for 18 plus 4.99 shipping which i accepted which gave me a gross profit of $4.22, sold after 855 days. So I still have a bunch of them. They're just still selling. So something that I'm really heartened by, I think that's a word, disheartened, heartened, is a lot of my sales, a good, a good chunk of my sales are from items that have, I've listed recently, which is good because it feels like my hard work is paying off. I have gotten much more consistent with listing every day now that I've internet. And so this was a sale that sold same day and it was a pair of Spanx flare jeans. If you watched one of my Crossroads haul videos, I'll link it up on the screen. I showed these Spanx flare jeans and I was like, we'll see you know, how these do. It's a good barometer to see how Spanx is performing and they perform really, really well. So I'm very, high on Spanx right now. I had them, they were like Spanx flare jeans, the jeans, the flare jeans and stuff seemed to do really well by Spanx in a medium tall size. I enlisted for 75 and received an offer same day that I listed them for 60 on eBay, which I accepted. And that resulted in a gross profit. I had them listed for 78 actually, but 60 plus 7.99 shipping. A gross profit of $48.19 because my cost of goods was so low because I did the bins to crossroads strategy and my conversion rate is great. So yeah, sold same day. Love, love, love that. Let me get these labels on. Okay, my next sale was actually one that I had for quite a while, so I was really happy to sell it. I guess I, oh, I got them at the bins. I thought I got them at a regular Goodwill, but that's good. I got them at the bins for 95 cents. It was a pair of ATM Anthony Thomas Melillo stretch trouser pants in a size zero. This is a good designer brand, but this was an older style. I'd definitely pick it up again at the bins though. I had it listed for 40 and someone sent me an offer for 36 plus 7.99 shipping on eBay, which I accepted, which gave me a great gross profit of $30.98, but took 489 days to sell. So I'd still pick it up again. I think that's really good. Okay, my next sale was, I probably could have sold this for more, but do y'all remember, I think it was in that same Crossroads haul, I found this Eileen Fisher dress, it was new with tags, or maybe it was, not no, it might have been a previous one, I don't know. And really excited about it, but it had a hole in it. Well, I missed the return window, so I went ahead and just listed it, and I knew I was going to get my money back, because I only spent, with that conversion, $11.98 on it. So I was like, okay, let's just make our money back and move on. <laughs> Yeah, essentially. So I, if it was new attack with no flaws, I would have listed for like 90 to 100. But because it had a hole that was like 
fairly significant. I listed for 60 and then I received an offer on eBay for 35 plus 7.99 ship. I think I could have got 40 for it, but just went ahead and accepted it. So I um, made a gross profit of $19.88, which really still good and it sold within five days. That was a good sale. I, again, probably could have got more for it, but just so happy. And I'm happy that, you know, I got it a new home. Next was a Leith sweater. This is something I've had from Liquidation for forever. I've had it 1,180 days. I had it listed for 25 and someone sent me an offer for 1250 plus 699 shipping, which I accepted. After everything, my gross profit was $2.06 because my cost of goods was $7.20 on this palette per item. It's weird. I have these Leith sweaters. I sold two of them. I sold another one on Poshmark, which we'll see. But I have a bunch of Leith cardigans, like the same style in different colorways and in different sizes. And for whatever reason, right now, I'm getting a lot of eyeballs on this colorway and extra small. I still have two more. Okay, and then I had these in my laundry room for the longest time. They are men's sweatpants, but they have a bunch of flaws. I even put flaws and caps in the title, just stains and so forth. But... I just went, decided to go ahead and list them anyway because I got them at the bins for $1.44. I listed them for $30. I received an offer for, I think we went back and forth, but I countered with $20 plus $7.99 shipping, which they accepted, which gave me a gross profit of $12.82, which isn't bad. And they sold after nine days. So that's pretty fast, you know. If these were in excellent condition, would have sold for more, obviously, but um, sold really fast and still had a decent profit, so... Happy I picked those up. A lot of people passed on because condition, but certain brands, even though condition is poor, you can still pick them up and make 15 bucks or whatever it is. Okay, and then this is something I've actually had for quite a while. I'm kind of cooling off on this brand, Draper James, but this was a unique piece in that it was a, I couldn't find the style name anywhere. It was a Dent a chambray top in a size 12, which I thought was a good size. But anyway, I had it got from the bins for $1.01. Had a list of, I think I'd lowered the price to $25. Someone offered me $12 plus $5.99 shipping, which I just went ahead and accepted. That gave me a gross profit of $7.58. And I had him for 200 and had this for 277 days. So yeah, Draper James, I don't know. Just with this sale and then I picked up Draper James and checked comps on it later and it didn't perform that well and I returned that piece. Also had flaws. So I don't know. I Draper James we'll see. I'm sure certain pieces still do really well. But it used to be a, a brand that I'd pick up, especially at the bins, without even thinking twice. Now I might think twice. <laughs> But I'd probably still pick it up. And then this was a blogger favorite Zara dress. It performed really well when I checked it out on, um, when I checked comps. But had a small flaw, so I listed it a little bit lower. It was a Zara cutout poplin dress. I think I had it listed for 40 And I received an offer for 28 plus $5.99 shipping, or they accepted my offer to like her, I think. And that gave me a gross profit of $13.17, and it sold after 86 days. So, not bad. I'm definitely cooling off on Zara, too. I love picking it up at the bins. I, I got this one at a regular Goodwill for $7.99. I'm really, I don't pick it up at a regular Goodwill that much anymore at all, but I'll pick it up at the bins certain pieces. I'm actually going to go set those out now, and then we'll do my Poshmark sales. Printed off my Poshmark labels and got them in order. All right, let's start with my Poshmark sales. So this one was a really good sale and it's to someone who recently bought a bundle from me and then they bought this coat. And so I don't know if they're a YouTube viewer, but if they are, thank you so much. I really appreciate this, uh, your business. This, I love this coat. I really contemplated keeping it for myself. And if you watched in the throw with me where I didn't find much, I did find this coat, which was actually an excellent find. It is the Patagonia Vosk 3-in-1 coat. Goodwill had it marked up high at 30 bucks, but it is a really expensive, really nice coat. That's a double layer, it's a three-in-one parka. So it's got like a puffer layer that you can zip out, take out, and it's also, you know, got a soft shell, but then you can also layer the two, which is really cute. I had this listed for, I think, $2.59 because that's what Patagonia has it listed for on their secondhand website. So on their already worn items. So I just went ahead and listed it the same as them. I think it's a coat that retails for a lot, like 400 or something. 
and I received an offer from this buyer for $195, which I accepted, which I was happy to accept. So I'm gonna put it in a box. I hope it doesn't make it go over five pounds though. Oh, I do have these, I have these extra large mailers. They're not my favorite, but might be the best solution in this case. Okay, so I sold it for 195 and only in three days. And so that gave me a profit of 126 bucks, which is great. Really, really, I think that was like my only sale that day. <laughs> but it was a great sale, so very grateful. So my next sale received in liquidation and for whatever reason, it just never got listed. I don't know why. So then when I moved into this office, it was just like one of those things that was like floating around <laughs> off my previous office. So when I got to this one, I was like, I'm just gonna go ahead and list this. And it's this Ted Baker Paisley Silk Tie Pocket Square set. I thought it was gonna sell, I wanted to get it up before Christmas. I thought it was gonna sell for Christmas, but it ended up selling for full price the other day. But yeah, it was this Ted Baker gift set, paid $6 for it in liquidation. Had it listed for 35 and it sold for 35. And that gave me a gross profit of 22 bucks. It took 134 days to sell, so not horrible. Yeah, I'm just gonna put it in a flat rate mailer. I never did this, but I think we're allowed to. My next sale was a, oh, I listed this recently too. An Anthropology Saturday Sunday fringe kimono sweater. It was one size. I had it listed for 50 and someone sent me an offer for 30, which I went ahead and accepted. After only six days, my cost of goods was zero. It resulted in a profit of $24, which is great after six days. Hopefully this fits in a envelope, in a poly mailer rather. Okay, let's answer a question. How do you know how to price your items? Having a hard time pricing. So what you wanna do first, you wanna look at, find out the style name of your item. Then you look up what available comps are. So you have this item, okay? How, how I price this item, this Komodo sweater. I went to Poshmark, searched for this sweater. I looked at what was available. They must have been priced, you know, in that $50 range. If I wanted to get an aggressive, like if I wanted to price aggressively to get a quick sale, you could price under market value. So if everyone else was pricing it at $60 and you really wanted to sell it quickly, you could price it at $40 or you could price according to market value, but I wouldn't price above it, above what other people are pricing it unless, unless you have basically the only one available in that size or in that colorway or something, then you can kind of command the market. But you also though want to look at sold comps. You don't want to just look at available comps. Because there are oftentimes the cases where items are selling for significantly less than what sellers are listing it at. A good rule of thumb is to just price 20 to 30% of whatever it's selling it at. But then there are also situations where your sold comps are gonna be higher than your available comps because it used to sell for a lot and now it doesn't. So it's important to look at both. Hope that makes sense. On eBay, I think when you look at sold, you only see the past 90 days. So you don't have that issue as much where you're looking at, you know, sold comp data from like years ago, but Poshmark, you know, you could be looking at sold comps, especially if it's an item that's pretty, pretty like rare or um, just not a common seller. You can be looking at sales from like years ago. And if you're pricing off of that, then you might be pricing too high. Okay, next is, like I said, another Leaf cardigan sweater. This one sold for $10. I've just had these for so long. I just, <laughs> I'm just moving them, which is good. I probably didn't, I probably just broke even, if that. Uh, yeah, I lost 15 cents, but it's fine because I had money, I have money going into my bank account. That's what I mean when I talk about cash flow. Like I spent $7.20 on this item, $1,000. 179 days ago. So I've been out $7.20 for a very long time. And at this point it's like, okay, well, I just need to get my money back so I can reinvest it somewhere else. So I essentially did that. I mean, I essentially broke even, lost 15 cents, but got my money back. 
can move on with my life. And it's taking, not no longer taking up space in my inventory and it's actually going to be used, which is good. Okay, my next sale, come on. <laughs> my next sale is crazy. I was at the bins on Saturday and someone liked this Zara dress on Mercari. So I sent out an offer or, you know, whatever it's called on Mercari, promoted it, I don't know, sent out offers. And I was like, I've had this piece for this dress for so long. I had multiple uh, cover or stock photos within the listing. I was like, why don't I just try another one of these stock photos for the cover photo? So I switch it on Mercari, I switch it on Poshmark. And then literally like less minutes later, I get an offer on Poshmark for the dress and I'd had it quite a while, 654 days. So I don't know if it's just cause I shared it at the right time or it was the cover photo change, but I was really, really happy that that happened and I had that result. So it's the Zara, a really cute contrast dress, handkerchief hem. It was back when I was buying Zara at a regular Goodwill, so I spent $9.99 on this dress. And I had lowered the price a couple months ago to $38. And then I received an offer for 25, which I was happy to accept. It resulted in a gross profit of $10.01, which is not bad. But yeah, it did take 654 days. So I'm just not really buying Zara at regular Goodwills anymore. But unless it's like a really substantial on-trend piece. But even when I find really substantial on-trend pieces, I'll always check comps and I usually Put it back so i've just kind of stopped wasting time but i'd pick it up at the bins if i came across it and at the very least i would take it to crossroads from the bins okay well my camera overheated and i have one more sale to package up so let me just go over what sold real quick that i just packaged up the next sale was a brand that i've been really loving picking up i stopped picking up for a while and then i was decided to start experimenting with it again and Every single time I pick it up, it sells well. This was the only one actually that took a little bit longer than usual to sell, but still sold really well. So it's a pair of COS, C-O-S, pants, and they're high leg wide trouser pants. I got them at Goodwill for $9.99 and I had them listed for $50. And they sold, I think, to an offer to Liker or no. No, they sold, someone sent me an offer for $40, which I accepted, which gave me a gross profit of $19.99. And they took 38 days to sell, which is not long at all. Um, I've just had other cost pieces sell even faster. And then I sold this Athleta Snappy sweatshirt that I got at the bins a while ago. I had it listed for 25 and received an offer for 15, which I went ahead and accepted, which gave me a gross profit of $10.88. And it did take 402 days to sell. So certain pieces by Athleta, this being one of them, is not going to sell very quickly, not very going to sell for a lot of money. I mean, you do have to be selective when, when it comes to Athleta, but I am really happy about that sale. And then I picked this up at Crossroads recently. It was a Cezanne Louisa robe or dress, robe, <laughs> just what is French for dress. Anyway, I, because of my conversion, I spent $10.38 on it. I had a list of for 130 and this buyer and I kept going back and forth and I decided to let it go for 80. I could have probably gotten more for it, like, I don't know, 90 to 100. I was happy to make a good profit and move on. So it gave me a gross profit of $53.62, which is great. And it took 27 days to sell. Okay, this was an experiment, a very successful experiment. I picked these up at the bins. It was in a recent haul. How do you pronounce this brand? Vervet or Verve? This is a jean denim brand. It doesn't retail for a lot. It retails for like $50 to $70 per pair, which I mean, you know, is a lot, but compared to other premium denim brands, isn't too, too much. But this particular style performed really well. I listed it for 40, sold full price, same day I listed it for 40 which gave me a gross profit of $30 and six cents cause I, you know, got it at the bins. If I came across something like this again at the bins, I'd definitely pick it up. But now I'm wondering, do I try picking it up at a regular Goodwill? I don't know, maybe half off I would. And I have a bunch of these still. They are, this is the one I forgot to <laughs> wrap up. It is a found tie dye sweatshirt. Really, really comfy and soft. If y'all want one, it's a size large. I have a bunch. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I got through liquidation. I have a list for 25. I received an offer for 12, which I accepted, which gave me a gross profit of $4.20. It took 597 days to sell. 
And then I don't know why this took so long to sell, but it's really nice. I did recently lower the price. It is a New Attack Mark New York wool blend coat, a really beautiful coat I got in liquidation. I had it listed for over $100, but then I recently lowered the price to 90 because I've had it quite a while. And then I received an offer yesterday for 65, which I went ahead and accepted, and that gave me a gross profit of 46, but it took 1,218 days to sell, so. Um, and then my last sale was actually this morning, and it was a pair of Prana high-waisted leggings that I featured in a recent haul. Um, I got them at Goodwill for $7.99. I had them listed for $38, and someone sent me an offer for $25, which I just went ahead and accepted, which gave me a gross profit of $12.01, which was solid because it only took three days to sell. So that's kind of what I was expecting from this. Maybe I was hoping for like a $30 sale, but I'm really happy that it sold quickly and had a solid return. Okay, I'm going to go package those up. My microphone keeps dying. <laughs> which is so annoying, the receiver part of it. So I am going to package those sales up, get this charged. I'm gonna do a little bit of photographing and then I'll meet you back at the inventory table and we'll answer some more questions. All right, let's do some inventorying. Hopefully we can get all of this done. But I went through all the questions that y'all sent in and picked a few out that I wanted to make sure to answer because I'm realizing now I'm not gonna be able to get to all of them. <laughs> How many hours do you think you work a week? So I work, what, for about four hours a day because I have to commute. I don't really count that as, like I have to drive to the office, which is a 10 minute drive. And then also things eat into that four hour period. But then now that I have internet at home, I probably also work another hour at home. And I also work Monday through Sunday. So that's four to five hours a day, seven days a week you know, like 35 hours, 30, 35, 28 to 35, I should say. So it's not bad, it's like part-time. <laughs> and I think for how much we make from it, it's good. Okay, so one person asked, what makes paying for an office justifiable over working from home, in your opinion? A comment I get on videos a lot is like, with the numbers that you're <laughs> producing, because I have, what, five to $6,000 in sales right now, per month, how can you afford office space? And our office is very affordable, luckily. We just moved into a much more affordable office space. I'll just never move my reselling business back into our house, unless we had like a huge house and I had like a, I could have a room dedicated to it. I would, or like a basement or something, I won't move it back into my house. We just don't have the space in our house. I would just take up another profession, honestly. <laughs> like I just won't do it. I thought about it and I was like, no, um, I can't work out of our garage. I, this is not going to happen. So, I mean, that would probably be the solution working out of my garage. And I really don't want to do that. It's, a, you know, I make enough money where I can cover the office space and pay myself. It's not like an amazing amount of money, but it's definitely, I definitely make enough. But the fact that I have to split my time between YouTube and reselling, and I only have four hours a day, and then I also have to take care of my dad on top of that. Like, I spent every Tuesday and Thursday, like, an hour and a half of my four hours getting breakfast with him. Or, yeah. So, just things cut into it. And so, I probably honestly work 20 to 25 hours a week, if I'm being honest. Do you prefer working for it by yourself or bet when you had an employee better? So when I had an employee, it was a very different setup in that I basically ne very rarely went to the office. I went to the office to drop off inventory and like talk to Tomas for like 20 minutes, but they were the ones working in the office and I worked from home. I just did my listings at home. And so even though I had an employee, I didn't really see them that much. I wasn't like working side by side with them. We, I mean, we work closely together in that we like, you know, talked every day and not having to photograph or inventory or steam or do any of that was nice. But I really am enjoying working for myself. Like I really, really enjoy being, having full control of the whole process. I don't know. I just really like being a solo reseller. It's not bad. I like it. Someone asks, why more Goodwill stores versus the outlet? Has your business model changed? I don't think I actually, I mean, I'd be curious to look at that number, but I think I probably list, I know I'm selling the same, because I talked about this in uh, my January sales recap video, which I'll link up on the screen. I'm selling the same amount of items from the bins and regular Goodwill per month, at least I did last month. And I think I'm probably listing about the same. It just looks like I source at the regular Goodwill more because I don't film myself going to the bins because 
I don't want to. I just have kind of like drawn that line in the sand where filming at the Vins is like makes the whole experience so much worse. Like <laughs> just, it just the thrifting at the Vins is already kind of like chaotic. But adding a camera and me talking to the camera into the mix is just makes it so less enjoyable. Whereas a thrift store, you know, it's a way more relaxed environment. And I actually like bringing a camera into there sometimes. So I just choose to film those experiences and then just do bins hauls. And so I, and I, when I go to the bins, I go to the bins once a week typically. And I typically get like 20 to 30 items. That actually leads into the next question, which is how many items a day am I listing? So I'm getting maybe 30 items from the bins, 30 items plus from a regular Goodwill, and then some items from Crossroads. So I would say that's like congruent with how many items I'm listing. I'm listing currently five to eight per day. So I list five to eight a day. That's, you know, 35 to 56 a week. I'd probably say it skews more towards the five and maybe even less historically, but I've been pretty um, consistent recently since in the past 10 days or so. So yeah, that's how many I'm sourcing. That's how many I am listing. And this will be my last question. What's something that keeps you going when you're in a reselling slump? And I am assuming you're saying there's two slumps that can come with reselling. One is like a sales slump, which sucks. And then the other is just when you're feeling completely demotivated and you just don't want to do it anymore, which also sucks, but in a different way. And the two can coincide and they oftentimes do because when you don't have any results from your work, it can be demotivating. I would say I really, really, really try very hard to focus on my listing goal and that's it. Just really hyper focus on how many listings do I want to get done per week or per month and that's all I pay attention to and let the rest kind of work itself out in terms of sales. I try really hard not to focus on, oh, I want to make this much money this month because I have less control over that. And the more I focus on that, the more I can get really demotivated. So it's just historically, in my experience in the past, whatever, seven years I've been doing this, if I focus on listings, the sales will work themselves out. That's just how it goes. That's what I would say is focus on what you do have control over. And if you're really still hitting your goals, but you're not hitting your monetary goals over a long period of time, like several months, then reevaluate and see like, okay, am I picking up the wrong kind of inventory? Am I, is there something wrong with my listings? Am I not pricing right, etc.? There are things that definitely can be going wrong internally, but if you're not listing, then it's hard to consistently, it's hard to really audit those things and make it prudent changes. That is the Q&A video. It's a little bit chaotic one. Thanks for sticking along with me and I hope it was interesting or helpful or I hope I just kept you company while you're working. All right, well, I will see y'all in the next one. Okay, love y'all.